Hello and uh, welcome uh, to this lecture on applied uh, hemodynamics. This lecture is designed uh, to be taken in conjunction with an undergraduate uh, medical school curriculum and uh, doesn't stand alone. I'd recommend uh, one of the standard physiology textbooks. Please note the disclaimer. I'd like to introduce you to, to the first principles of hemodynamic pressure and how it applies to human physiology. We'll do some simple mathematical equations and then I suppose really apply it uh, in some uh, pretty familiar circumstances. These are the learning uh, objectives of this uh, lecture. It's always useful to begin with the definition and put simply, hemodynamics involves the study of forces involved in circulation of the blood, hemo being uh, blood and dynamics being movement of. Typically the units used are millimetres of mercury and uh, in pulsatile uh, vessels and chambers, we use some approximations. Uh, so, for example, if we're talking about systolic pressure, that's the highest uh, pressure recorded. For example, aortic systolic pressure might be 120. Pulmonary systolic pressure might be 25. Diastolic is the lowest pressure recorded. So, for example, aortic diastolic pressure might be 80 millimeters of mercury. Pulmonary diastolic pressure would be 8. Left ventricular end diastolic pressure might be 8 right ventricular end diastolic pressure might be 4 or 6. We arbitrarily define pulse pressure as the difference between systolic and diastolic pressure. And finally, we similarly arbitrarily calculate that the mean arterial pressure is the diastolic pressure plus one third of the pulse pressure. This equation applies to arteries, uh, but not to left or right ventricles, and clearly would apply to lower pressure chambers like the atria. I'm just after noting a typographical error here. This should say uh, pulse pressure, not diastolic pressure. In veins, the pressure is much lower. And when we talk about central venous pressure, which we'll talk about again, central venous pressure is generally low in healthy states, and it rises in states of congestion. When we look at venous waveforms, particularly in the great veins, these are complex. We have A, C, V waves and X and Y descents. And this reflects venous return and heart function. In the disease state, central venous pressure can rise due to right ventricular failure or if there's left ventricular failure, pushing pressure back through the uh, right heart. If the central venous pressure is very low, that can correspond to hypovolemia, which can be re resulting from, for example, acute hemorrhage. Due to the laws uh, of physics, blood flows from high to low pressure. It won't passively go in any other direction. We define Q as the volume of blood per unit time. For example, uh, milliliters per minute squared. Sorry, milliliters per minute or cubic centimeters per minute. And there's a key equation whereby flow is directly proportional to the pressure head and inversely proportional to the, ref to the resistance. Essentially, it's Ohm's law where uh, V over I by R are alternatively in the human uh, circulation. We can talk about blood pressure uh, corresponding uh, to uh, voltage, carbon dioxide, sorry, car cardiac output corresponding uh, to uh, flow and total peripheral resistance corresponding to the resistance in the circuit. We'll come back to this again. This is a diagram essentially illustrating how the flow measured, in this case in litres per minute, is uh, proportional to the difference between P1 and P2. Flow is also proportional inversely to the resistance. The higher the resistance, the less the flow. And this corresponds to the fourth power of the radius. So resistance relates to the fourth power of the radius. In other words, a very small reduction in radius will have a profound effect on the resistance. This is Poussey's law, which essentially puts it all uh, in, in, into perspective and allows us to explain flow within a tube. It makes many assumptions, but it's simply thought of as flow is equal to pi because we're assuming this is a perfect sphere, so it relates to the area of a circle, by the change in pressure, which in this case is P1 minus P2, and related to the fourth power of the radius, divided by 
a constant of 8, and the viscosity multiplied by the length. Therefore, flow is proportional to the fourth power of the radius. So as the radius goes up, the flow goes up in a much more dramatic manner. Or as we said before, if the radius reduces, then the flow reduces to the fourth power. This is important in human physiology because resistance arterioles determine total peripheral resistance. And these arterioles can constrict by a factor of four. So I'd like you to do a little mental experiment and try and work out how much can total peripheral resistance change based on the fact that arterioles can constrict by a factor of four. So moving on then to the other factors in Poussey's law that define uh, flow, we're going to look at the viscosity. So there are four main determinants that I'm going to discuss with you of viscosity. Hematocrit, blood vessel diameter, the velocity of the flow, and then normal or abnormal blood constituents. Just a slight digression before we get on to this. Turbulence is defined as uh, the flow that occurs when the Reynolds number is exceeded. And essentially the Reynolds number relates to the velocity, the diameter of the blood vessel, the density of the uh, fluid and the viscosity of the fluid. Essentially when blood exceeds a certain velocity it goes from laminar to turbulent flow. So this is, di this is diagrammatically what laminar flow whereby the central column of blood moves the fastest and the outer columns moves the slowest. Well, turbulent flow is more chaotic and is clearly less efficient. So, back to the determinants of blood viscosity. Well, hematocrit is the main determinant of viscosity. In normal blood, uh, with a hemoglobin, say, between 12 and 15, the hematocrit has viscosity about three times that of water. You can get an increase in your red blood cell count related to chronic hypoxemia. This is called secondary polycythemia. Or there can be primary polycythemia, whereby there is a primary increase in the signals to bone marrow to make additional red cells. But in general, the higher the hemoglobin, the greater the viscosity, and therefore the greater work of the heart. On the other hand, if you have decreased uh, red cell count, for example in anemia, it reduces the viscosity, but remember it does so at the cost of reducing the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. And of course that leads to a hyperdynamic circulation and can indeed lead to a thing called high output cardiac failure. The polycythemia of chronic uh, hypoxia, for example, in people with chronic obstructive lung disease or altitude, has the advantage in that it increases the oxygen carrying capacity but is the disadvantage that by increasing the viscosity it actually increases the work of delivering that blood to the organs. Blood vessel diameter is an important determinant also. Essentially, viscosity is actually reduced in very small blood vessels, specifically capillaries, and this helps favour flow when velocity is slow. Remember that red cells only have 10 seconds to equilibrate in capillaries to allow gas and nutrient exchange. Velocity increases and vis viscosity follows. So, sorry, the viscosity of blood flow increases as flow velocity decreases because of the formation of rouleau, where red cells tend to adhere to one another at lower uh, speeds. This, of course, is aggregated by stasis, which can occur in veins. Finally, then viscosity will change if there's high plasma protein concentrations, for example, conditions called mi uh, multiple myeloma, multiple myeloma and Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, where you've got a vast excess of plasma proteins which increase viscosity. The next thing I'd like to talk to you about in hemodynamics is the law of Laplace. And this is assumed that in a cylinder, that the wall tension is a function of the transmural pressure and the radius of that vessel. And the clinical implications, of course, would be that in, say, someone who has hypertension, that uh, as the pressure rises, there's a significant increase in the wall tension. And similarly, in patients with aneurysms, which is a pathological dilatation of a blood vessel, uh, 
that as the radius increases, the wall tension rises significantly. Another measure of uh, blood vessels relates to uh, the ease of distensibility, or so-called compliance. And notice that for every unit change in volume, there's a unit change in pressure. So veins, by definition, are more compliant than arteries, and as such, because their compliance contains 60 to 70% of blood volume at rest. Of course, as we age, arterial compliance reduces and systemic pressure rises. So for every change in volume, there's a larger change in pressure. This slide outlines where the majority of blood resides in the body. Within the left ventricle and left atrium, there's only 4%. The, the aorta, large and small arteries and arterioles, and remember the arterioles are the principal resistance vessels, there's 16% of circulating blood volume. The capillaries, which is the only place where gas exchange can occur, only has 4%. Veins have a staggering 64%. And the right heart, similar to the left heart, has about 4%. The next thing we'll come on to is the velocity of blood flow. And you can kind of work this backwards if you think about it. The volume of blood through the system of circulation has to be the same, but the velocity will vary depending on the cross-sectional area. That makes sense. So reductive velocity, we're talking about the speed, so that might be in metres per second. So blood flows fastest in the aorta, and slows to the capillaries. And if we have partially occluded vessels, then we get flow acceleration if the flow is meant to be continuous, and as such flow can move from laminar to turbulent. Let's briefly touch then on cardiac output. In health, the cardiac output is measured at 5 litres per minute. And of course, we'll increase our cardiac output commensurate with organ requirements. Cardiac output is calculated by the heart rate multiplied by the stroke volume. And of course, the stroke volume of either the left or the right ventricles relates to the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume. In other words, how much blood is there at the beginning of systole minus how much blood is there at the end of systole. So to increase our cardiac output, for example, during exercise, we need to increase our heart rate. We can reduce end systolic volume and we can increase end diastolic volume. There are local cardiac mechanisms, including the Frank Starling law, relating to the overlap of myofilaments and of course the role of the autonomic nervous system including sympathetic innervation directly on the heart, withdrawal of parasympathetic or vagal innervation and finally circulating catecholamines and all of these conspire together to increase the cardiac output in response to increased physiological demands. So therefore how do we measure blood flow? Well you can indirectly estimate it if you perform Doppler ultrasound studies and this is based on calculating the velocity of the blood. So if you know the curve sectional area, the cross-sectional area, and you integrate the velocity, it's possible to estimate cardiac output. Indicator dilution techniques can be used, for example, uh, indocyanide green or thermodilution mechanisms. Radioisotope dilution studies can also be used. And finally, then the FIG principle, which I'm just going to briefly outline for you. This diagram is meant to explain uh, to you the principles behind FIG. So what we have here is normal flow. And as blood goes through an organ bed, it gives up its oxygen. So it goes from red to blue. Now let's supposing the blood is moving very slowly. If the blood moves very slowly, then there's more time for each little red cell to give up its oxygen. So the blood becomes more blue at the end. On the other hand, if you have high velocity and high cardiac output, the red cells wheel along and there's less time for gas exchange. So this, uh, the blood is less blue at the end of the gas exchange. Now to put this into principle scene, if we take systemic saturation, for example, the saturation that you might find in your femoral artery, and let's say that's 100% in health, it's 100% saturated, because blood has circulated through the lungs, there's been free gas exchange, the hemoglobin is entirely saturated, and there's been no gas exchange since the blood has gone from the lungs to the left ventricle, to the aorta, and down to the femoral artery. If we were also to measure the saturation in the pulmonary artery, we'll call this the pulmonary artery saturation, this is where oxygen has been extracted by the tissues and it's heading from the right ventricle to the lungs. So it's in its most desaturated state. It's just before it's going to pick up its oxygen. So in health, for example, 
the difference between systemic arterial saturation and pulmonary arterial saturation would be 34%. And this would be a normal finding. If, however, the flow is slow, let's suppose we have a low cardiac output, say, for example, if someone has advanced heart muscle disease. Well, we can still pick up blood through the lungs because the lungs work fine, so the systemic oxygen saturation might still be 100%. But because the blood is moving slowly and the cardiac output is lower through the tissues, to maintain adequate uh, tissue perfusion, there's greater extraction of oxygen. So let's, for example, say that the pulmonary arterial saturation would be 40% because the blood is moving more slowly through the organ beds. And this will give us a higher gap, a 60% gap between systemic arterial and pulmonary arterial saturation. And this corresponds with a low cardiac output. So as the change in saturation changes, then the cardiac output changes. Let's suppose we have a high flow state, for example, someone with thyrotoxicosis or hyperdynamic circulation. Again, we'll assume that the lungs are picking up oxygen well, so femoral arterial saturation will be 100%. However, because the blood is traveling much more quickly, it has less time to give up its oxygen. So it's pinker, there's a higher saturation of blood as it uh, exits the vascular bed and as it heads back for the lungs to pick up oxygen again. So let's say it's 75%. So as you can see, the difference between the systemic arterial saturation and the pulmonary arterial saturation, which we're standing in for mixed venous oxygen saturation, is less, it's 25%. So in other words, as delta becomes larger, sorry, as delta becomes smaller, as delta becomes less, cardiac output heads upwards. And this is the principle of FIC, and it's commonly used around the world to estimate cardiac output when we're using a pulmonary artery catheter. It makes many assumptions. It makes assumptions regarding the uptake of uh, oxygen from tissues, which of course will depend on the metabolic activity. It's also critically dependent on the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. So the haemoglobin has to be worked into the equation. But it is a very useful method, and that's the method of FIC. So I hope you think after this short talk that hemodynamics is highly logical. There are just a few key equations that are vital to understanding circulation. And I hope with further reading, you'll get a good appreciation of the importance of hemodynamics in mammalian circulation. Thank you.